All right, people. Technical difficulties like you would not believe. So we're trying. Well, we broke the internet today. Oh, there you go. So hang in there. We'll get started here in a second. All right. <laughs> okay. So where... So this is useless. Welcome to the pre-show, 34 minutes into uh, when we should have done the show. <laughs> All right, where do I go, Dave? Uh, what? I mean, is there, a, is there a preview to make sure that people can see us? Well, it okay. says it's live. Yeah, you want to go to videos? Does it just go left? live? Yeah. Oh, well, that looks okay. The question is, can people hear us? If you can hear us, say something. Do you want to try to get the audio? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're going to have better luck with just the, just that? the mic on the, okay. on the phone. Are you listening to see what the quality yeah, is like? Now, so okay. Let me see here. Well, I don't know why. Oh, there it is. Okay, you're going to get some feedback, people, so bear with me. Testing. Well, I don't know why. That's not terrible. Oh, there it is. Okay, you're going to get some feedback, people, so bear with me. Testing. I can live with that. All right. Okay. Well, Dave, thank you. So what happened was, uh, welcome to PrinterBot Live. We are starting at 5.05, and uh, the reason it took so long is we were all dialed with, like, fancy audio stuff. And, uh, yeah, that was going well. And then we tried to log our Mevo camera onto the Facebook app, and it said, no! So Mevo's the, the little camera that can uh, pan around and hook in audio and do all this stuff. Yeah, right now we have a cell phone uh, rubber banded to the Mevo camera as a stand-in, so sorry about that. But I'm just going to go on like it's... Uh, like everything's normal. You might have to do a little camera work, Dave, just yeah. for so people can see what I'm holding. But right now, it's okay. So the first thing I want to talk about this week uh, is uh, we have started to print parts for our electric motor. Now uh, I want to give you oh I want to give you a link to go to, and I I just want to these these guys are so great. Uh, it's Make C M A K E S E A. I put it in the uh, email to you, Dave. And Make C is uh, Make C.com. I have it open here, I think. Where'd it go? There it is. So I can, I think I can show you. Well, never mind. But uh, they have right on the front page 600 watt. Hallbach Array 3D printed brushless motor, and so that's what we're doing right here. Now I have some kits, and those include uh, some, we, we've only printed a few parts. We actually made a mistake on this. Uh, on these long prints, it, we see it start printing and then we go home. And uh, the bummer was we had the tip size wrong, and so we just over extruded. This thing weighs a ton. So anyway, but we're gonna reprint this. But at least it's a visual aid to show you, this one is, this one is completely correct. Um, it's just one of the parts. There's a bunch of parts on this. This is an outrunner motor. And this is the, the part I wanted to show you. So on the inside of this, I think you can see there's some grooves. It's okay if they don't see it totally. But we've got these. If you order a kit from them, you get these neodymium uh, magnets. And they're like bar magnets. And what's cool is when you 3D print uh, this case, you know, this outrunner, um, there's sleeves for this to go in, and they are really, really, even with this bad print, it's just over extruded, um, they fit in really, really nice all along the edge there. So you would, uh, it gives you very strict instructions that you have to follow, 
because this is a Hallbach array. So I wanted to talk briefly about a Hallbach array. So um, you can see I've got two in there. And then uh, a Hallbach array is not like normal electric motors. So you would have alternating in a, in a regular brushless motor. By the way, this is brushless. Uh, you know it's a brushless motor when you have three uh, leads coming out of your motor. This is, a, this is an outrunner. <clears throat> uh, so the can is spinning. This is a, like for a quadcopter. Uh, when the can spins, it's an outrunner. There's outrunners and inrunners. Uh, it just means the position of the magnets on this is on the outside and then the opposite would be inside. So the electromagnets are the coils inside. And in this kit, you actually get the wire uh, to wrap your coil. So we'll have this really complicated piece, printed piece, where you wrap the wire up and skip and go down and you have to follow the instructions. But we're going to do everything there is to do to make a brushless permanent magnet motor. So uh, the cool thing about this one is that these magnets are arranged, the poles on these magnets are arranged in a way to increase the strength of the, the field that these give off. So there's an electromagnetic field. It's like this imaginary lines of flux uh, that, that have this force. So when you have, uh, you know what I'm talking about even if you don't know the name of it. Um, you know, magnets fit together in a certain way here. Uh, but when you reverse one, and try to put it together, it doesn't want to doesn't want to push together. And these are unbelievably strong. I can't even hold on to them to keep them from flipping. You can only get them about that close. Ah, see, you can only get them about that close to each other. Ah, it's just so strong. Ah, there we go. So that is a lot of force there. Now these lines of. Uh, these lines of flux are what repel the electromagnetic coils and you can switch the, uh, what your ESC or elect, uh, electronic speed control um, does on these motors is it, it moves the field and so it keeps like pushing, it's like a wave almost, uh, you know, that just keeps pushing forward when you rotate that field. So these permanent magnets will uh, be the same poles and then it'll repel it so that it can it can move now uh, normally you would have like on this motor bruh, you have um, iron uh, it's a special type of iron but it's uh, it's made for uh, basically containing an electromagnetic magnetic field in a magnet so you got this metal this special metal around the outside that keeps the force of the electromagnetic uh, the the uh, force of the poles pointed towards the center of the motor, therefore keeping it th that field nice and strong. It doesn't let it get out here on the outside of the can. It does a little bit. But uh, when you 3D print a motor, we're not uh, able to, to just make a custom, um, a lot of times we'll do plates and stack the plates. Uh, we're not able to do that on this. We're not going to have metal on the outside. So this Hallbach array does the job of that. So what happens is you've got, uh, let's say north, north is up on this, and so you're gonna have a big loop. Well, over here, there's another magnet, and these are smaller magnets. See how small that is? Two of these equal the length of one. And so you rotate, uh, you will rotate the uh, magnet, we'll have to mark all of these magnets for north and south and which direction they point so that we, when we put them in, we put them in the right order. So we've got this magnet in there and let's say uh, north is, is this direction. There's a sleeve for these little magnets. It's kind of hard to get it started because it wants to jump. There it goes. So there's a sleeve for this little magnet so that the force of the little magnet let's say north is pointing this way, it points this way and it actually pushes, this is the weird thing about a Hallbach array, a special way to orient the poles of your magnets in a circle so that instead of the iron on the can forcing the lines towards the center, the magnets actually force the line towards the center. So the weird thing about it is um, you can, on some Hallbach arrays, if you do it all right, and spacing matters and all of that, uh, it can actually double the force of the field. 
So it contains the field. So you'll have just a little bitty loop down here and a big loop on this side because there'll be magnets on both sides pointing north, pushing, pushing that north. Now, don't take my word for it. Go to Wikipedia and uh, check it out. Or go to makeseed.com and check out uh, Hallbach Array. Really, really cool stuff. But I think it's the Hallbach Array that's going to make 3D printed motors um, as powerful as you know something that's similar, a brushless motor that's a similar size. Now I say as powerful as. You'll never get as efficient as you know all the right materials, the metals, um, but you can get pretty close with this. So this is uh, going to end up being a uh, 600 watt uh, Hallbach Array brushless motor, and so. I'm anxious to see what this thing can do. I'll try it on the bike, maybe on the go-kart, we'll see. I have four of these kits. Uh, we might be able to get it on our, our go-kart, maybe two, two of them, to see uh, how powerful this thing is. So you get metal rods and everything in here, so it's really cool. All right, so anyway, check out Make C. They're not paying me, although I paid for the files last week because I lost it. I, I bought them once and then lost them, lost the uh, files. So I went back in to uh, buy them again, bought them, and the guys that make C just said, you're not going to buy them twice, and they refunded my money. So they're great guys over there. Uh, I, I'm just trying to see how we can work together with these cool projects. So anyway, that's some progress on the electric motor. Now, next uh, link I want to take you to is I've been talking about uh, an open source go-kart. Now, if you haven't followed what I said a, a week or two ago, um, I have a bunch of designs that I've started, not finished, uh, with this go-kart. And it, was, it reminded me of when I was looking for the best uh, 3D printer back in 2010. The best RepRap design. And wow, there was a lot of opinions on that and a lot of bad designs. And then I was looking for uh, the best electronics for RepRap 3D printers. And, well, that was a lot of people had a lot of opinions. Well, anything you try to find open source that's the downside of open source. You've got a lot of opinions, a lot of people running different ways. I always like to say it's herding cats. And since there's just one guy going this direction and one guy going this direction, um, the end result of that product is gonna be limited by the amount of people that are involved. So part of the, the joy of the choices that I made at PrinterBot was they ended up being the right choices. We chose Marlin, um, although we did take a weird, like we used the Teensy chip instead of just an Arduino, which I kind of regret. Uh, but Marlin continued to be developed. We added code back in, and so we got a lot of people going the same direction. And PrinterBot is alive today because uh, an open source, not just uh, the, the electronics, which we open source, but also um, the designs, we let people mod. What, now that Mevo's gonna, oh, it just turned off. That's probably just the eye. Okay, I just heard it go clink. Anyway, so, um, I was looking for an open source go-kart that had some momentum and I couldn't find anything. Uh, the one I found was some guy that said you can't use it for commercial use. I don't like any, uh, you know, I used to do a non-commercial license, I dumped that. So we're totally, totally open source. So I wanna to stay totally, totally open source. So the next link I wanna give you is what I decided on is I was gonna put my energies, I don't wanna learn how to design uh, a go-kart or a car because um, I'm kind of like leaning towards well what about an NEV a neighborhood electric vehicle uh, it's legal in Lincoln I really like that idea I'm gonna I'm gonna start with that but uh, that's big enough to sit two people which is cool or four people even so if you go to the next link Dave uh, he'll put it in the comments it's openmotors.co, C-O, and if you go to uh, slash download, um, I think I can show you that. So this is the Open Motors car. So they, they have a dumb name for it, Tabby, <laughs> which to me is like, ugh, could you pick a more boring name? Um, there's two seat versions and four seat versions. Now I went a couple weeks ago and went to the download at the bottom, uh, the, the source file is downloadable and it was a 404 error. I just tried it and it did download. So I downloaded that into Fusion and uh, I'm gonna work with, actually my neighbor, uh, two doors down, 
He uh, has a sweet welder and he has a mandrel hydraulic tube bender and he's a blacksmith and he has a forge and he has all this stuff. So uh, he's gonna help me um, build this or at least some derivative of this. So I don't wanna reinvent the wheel as it were. Uh, I just wanna use something that, all the geometry on the suspension and stuff, you can fiddle with that stuff for years and not get it right. So instead, we're gonna start um, of course, I'll do research on electric motors on the side. Uh, I may end up finishing this go-kart I started with my son. Um, but really where I want to take the momentum is if we had a platform like this, uh, like the Tabby, it's, in, it's intended for exactly what I'm talking about, uh, kind of democratizing uh, vehicles. And so, oh, uh, what is it? What is the one that did the 3D printed car? Uh, local Motors. Local Motors, uh, you know, I'm, I'm friendly with the CEO, super smart dude. He thought he was gonna 3D print a car. It ended up kind of seeming like a marketing thing. Um, you know, he finally got big sponsors and now you just see the same stuff, just like rehashed. You don't wanna 3D print a car, at least not yet. Uh, the, the printer that they use is like $2 million. Um, you know, so let's leave the safety of the vehicle, uh, I don't want it to be in question with plastic, you know, holding you, your butt off the ground. So this is steel frame, and then it's a blank platform. We'll, the fun that we'll have with 3D printing is we'll be able to print, uh, you know, panels for the car and the styling of the car. So uh, my boy, I asked him, uh, what car, if you could have any car, you know, body on something like this, what, what would you want? And he says, I want, a, 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 what is it, who made it? The Mini Cooper, the old one, not the new one, the old style uh, Mini Cooper. And so that's the one that I'm gonna try to uh, find a model of that. It, you know, it'll be kind of similar, not exactly, but you'll have, we'll have to change the wheelbase of this to match the car. So anyway, that's what I'm doing with the open source go-kart. It's really gonna be uh, the open motors platform. I'll modify it because I hate the way, it looks like a golf cart when you see people drive it. It's like this dorky, you know, you're like this far off the ground and everybody's like this. <laughs> I want to be like leaning back and low, uh, like my Porsche. So low to the ground, more fun, low center of gravity. Uh, and the Mini is, you know, a really small car anyway. So that's what I'm toying around with. So I do have the model. I have done some work on it. Um, at some point, after I remove a bunch of stuff, I don't know how to fork this file. You know, I'll share it with everybody. I guess I'll just put it on Fusion 360 and uh, let people download it and fiddle with it. We got to get some sort of a plan on, because uh, I'd love help on uh, the design stuff because, you know, there's, there's things to do. And I don't need to be, you know, an expert in uh, figuring out how to, mount some you know off the shelf cheap uh disc brakes to this body somebody else could do that and then we can fabricate it so i'd love to get multiple people helping me on this project the ultimate goal is this so the car is open source so you got your uh rolling chassis completely um you own it uh, and the files are free and everybody can modify it as as you want an open source motor controller which i found there's a couple um, interestingly, the VESC, which started as uh, like a RC car um, motor controller, that might be something, VESC, it's got to be, there it is, open source ESC. Uh, well, I pulled up a page called uh, Benjamin's Robotics. Um, anyway, this guy that was de developing this, he just said, you know, this sounds weird, but I want to make the best motor controller in the world. And uh, he basically did it in trying to rip off all his, uh, all his designs. But it's a really great e ESC. So it uh, has grown over the years, and he's added tons of uh, features. It became really popular amongst the scooter, uh, electric scooter, electric skateboard, electric bike. Um, you, it'll handle a lot of power. It's really cool. So for like this open source... Um, well, it's not open source, but the motor that I was showing you, you have to buy that. Uh, the, uh, the size of the, you know, bike or skateboard go-kart, 
the VESC would work for that motor or even off the shelf, uh, you know, hobby motors. Uh, so for a car, it's a little bit harder. Well, there's one guy that took the VESC and basically just upsized it to run uh, something that, as big as like, you know, the Leaf, the uh, uh, electric car. Who makes that? Nissan? Nissan Leaf. So uh, I forget what model of car that he ran, but he, he did a version of this, also open source, uh, that can run a car. Another friend of mine, I say friend, these are guys I just talked to on email. Um, I haven't met him in person, but uh, I forget. I think I've mentioned him before, but he created an open source motor controller um, that is really crazy. It can handle up to 200 kilowatts. That's a lot. That is a lot. I mean, you could get a heavy pickup and make that thing go with the 200 kilowatt motor. Uh, but anyway, so it handles big power, totally open source. Plans are out there. Really cool. I've even made some PCBs, had some PCBs made. Um, I forget how many I have, but I sold my pick and place before I got to populate those. So if anybody's interested in uh, learning more about that open source motor controller, I would be willing to give away um, some of those. Uh, it's SMD components, not all of them, a bunch of through hole stuff. I'll have to go through my uh, parts. If there's anybody in out there that wants to build one of these, um, I'd give you a PCB. But anyway, I'd run and get it, but I have to dig. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the open source motor controller is is real, and it's powerful enough to move a car, um, certainly an NEV. Uh, the last thing is an open source motor. And so the past few weeks, I've been in contact with a guy, and you can find him on YouTube. And here's the link. Uh, Dave's going to send you the link for the, his name is, uh, da, 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 da. It's the Masana, I'm trying to find it. Uh, I think I lost it, dang it. It was Matt, looks like Masina, there it is. Masina, it's another language. M-A-S-I-N-A, -S -S Electrica. So this guy, uh, I just say Julian, even though technically it's I-U-L-I-A-N. Uh, what's his name? Julian. We'll just call him Julian. Um, if you click on in the menu there, he's doing a, uh, well, he did a 35, in, in 2017, he did a 35 kilowatt outrunner motor, uh, permanent magnet. So it's a brushless motor. Now he's working on a larger size that I believe is 65, I think it's 65 uh, kilowatts. Yeah, there it is. It's the top one. And yeah, it's a, the, the, in his recent posts, you'll see it. Uh, open source high efficiency PMSM 65 kilowatt 2018 in construction. So I've been talking to him. We've uh, gone back and forth. I talked to him for a couple hours on the, on the Skype one day. So it's a BLDC motor, brushless. Um, it uses permanent magnets. Uh, let's see, he, he talks about it. Now this guy is no slouch. This isn't a hobbyist. This is a guy that I think he has his PhD in uh, whatever you need for designing electric motors. Um, so he has designed many motors. He goes into great detail uh, talking about his design. He has, uh, he's on YouTube. He's got big hits on his page. So a lot of people are following him. It's funny when you look at the comments, people are like, oh, can you send me motor? <laughs> And uh, they want the plans, they want to make these. So when he finishes the plans for this 65 kilowatt uh, open source motor, I'm going to have one made, maybe a couple. And I'm going to test it with the open source motor controller, put it in the open source car, and then start to work on some, there's probably stuff out there now, but I've got a software uh, friend who might be interested in doing some sort of a, you know, like dash display so you know what speed you're going. We're going to have to work through all of the you know turn signals and all that stuff you don't need a computer for that really but it might be cool to do uh, some software that actually handles the lights maybe there will be heaters air conditioning all kinds of electronic stuff in cars so anyway that's that so we're just getting rolling this is a long-term project and it's bringing together my love for electric motors open source 3d printing fabricating things that go fast and big challenges that many people would say there's no way you're ever going to get that done. Well, with enough people uh, 
a line in the same direction I think is possible. All right, enough of that. So just a couple of quick things. I'm all skewed on my time. How are we doing? Well, I was going to say, we've been at it 25 minutes. You'll have to keep in mind the photo and answer my battery. Okay. I'll, let me buzz through a couple of things and we'll try to um, get done really quick. So uh, first thing I wanted to tell you is the tank, uh, the printer tank. Let me, can you kind of move that down and just let me show this thing moving a little bit. We got this running today. Uh, I've decided, no offense to Bill over at uh, Polar 3D, but I had enough trouble um, with, uh, you know, changing tips and some of the, can you get it? down a little further I can see it so down just a little further that's good I'll get down here anyway I'm writing uh, just a test cube in uh, g-code and which forced me to like learn some stuff about g-code I didn't know uh, to be able to just print cube after cube after cube at Maker Faire I need this to work without the internet and with Bill's Polar 3D you have to be connected to the internet so I don't want to mess with that so I'm hand coding some g-code stuff he might be able to help me like save some time, but it's kind of fascinating learning this. Um, so this does work. Uh, I Nicholas Seward gets the credit on, uh, although I've done stuff like this with tanks before, he put uh, these tank treads, you know, I had these big, I had these big uh, sandpaper treads on the sides before. I was just asking for too much trouble. It looked cool, but it was a pain in the butt to tension and everything. So much easier to just use a little loop of belt down here. So I had, I pulled out some old, so there's a, I pulled out some old loops of belt that I had. These are XL belts. I have hundreds of uh, drive pulleys. So it was just an easy fix. So that's a X, that's Y. And I have fiddled with it a little bit. Um, this isn't a design I'm going to release quite yet. It's kind of a hack. So in the back, I, I wanna move it before I start tearing it apart, or at least turning it around to show you. Uh, Z, I still haven't, now you, you might not have seen it, but it was actually moving, Z is moving. So with the printer belt, you know, X is moving here and Y is going up at a 35 degree angle um, and the, the conveyor belt moves. So instead of a conveyor belt, this tank is just backing up, beep, beep. And uh, it's going to draw on the table, move back, draw some more, move back, move back, move back. So here's, uh, let me see here. See, it's moving back. It's very slow. You see it move? <laughs> and the tip is just kissing the, yeah. So I'll put some tape down and I'll get my custom G code and I'll just start, I'll print one and I'll back up and I'll print another and another and another at Maker Faire so you can see uh, kind of the concept of what's possible uh, with this cheap little tank. Now, now that I showed you it works, uh, it's not printing because again, I didn't want to put a Raspberry Pi on it and connect it to the internet. I just wanted to run on an SD card. But uh, a couple other possibilities with this, um, one, Right now I have these Z motors, uh, they're, they're paired together, so it's just gonna go back. But I have, this is an old printer board, and I can hook up the uh, extruder board, which gives you, uh, instead of one extruder, it would run three extruders. Well, I can use um, those other two, I won't need both of them, but I can put these on independent channels so that it can rotate this way. Now that won't be used in printing, but I may want to uh, kind of print in a spiral. So, or a, you know, a square getting ever bigger or something, or go down this way, turn around a little bit and come back so that it can just run forever. So, uh, it'd be kind of fun. So I'm thinking about doing that, um, but right now I just want to get this thing printing. And then once I see that the design, uh, that the whole concept works, let you guys build your own tanks. It's pretty easy to, I don't know, easy isn't really the word. It's not that easy. <laughs> but I will say that uh, the, the tank tread part is pretty easy. We just took a piece of extrusion and we put one plate on the end and we have our little tank tread, see? So it's there's a bearing here and a bearing here and then kind of like an old uh, you know World War I tank, 
Um, the highest one here is the drive motor, and it drives in reverse. So uh, very, very simple design. It's, it's pretty tight. The bearings protrude below the extrusion. So <clears throat> I did have to put some idler bearings up front here. I just hacked them on. Um, so, but it gave me an idea that uh, that would be how you could adjust if I do those bearings a little differently. Um, and this can all be printed parts, uh, but right now it's some laser cut, I hacked it. But so these idler bearings, it's kind of top heavy, you know, front heavy. Uh, when this is out there, it kind of, it leaned forward. So I put these idler bearings and now it's totally, it's firm. I could also elongate the uh, tread with some longer belt and have it, you know, pretty solid. But Nicholas Seward, he had one that's like really long at Murph and uh, he said he ran it a football field and it only got off of the straight line like it only deviated by like a couple of millimeters so pretty crazy uh, if you keep your belts short and on this one little panel we we do this in metal probably so there's no flex right now I can flex it with my hands uh, but if you do it in metal uh, it'll be so stiff and you cut your extruded aluminum really straight um, you'll have you know parallel tracks no problem and be able to run them I don't need to run them very far I really only need to run them uh, you know for whatever a print is and most prints you know on our printers are six eight inches at the most so as long as it runs straight for six or eight inches this is not a production thing people this is like a uh, this is a project so the, the stuff that you're gonna be printing is probably for fun I don't think this is a serious uh, you know, machine, but it's getting the concept of maybe a big E that would be like this scaled up. Uh, I'd probably use some sort of a track on the floor or something to make sure that it's a straight line. But I like the idea of printing on the floor for a very large printer because, um, you know, a printer belt of a car size doesn't make much sense, but just with some extruded aluminum up at a 35 degree angle well that's starting to make sense pretty cheap and the floor is the print bed so anyway that's the printer tank all right that's fine oh dave can you uh can you lift the camera up a little bit i can't quite reach it all right so that's that uh up a little bit more there all right so printer belt This will take 30 seconds. Here it is. You can't see it uh, down a little bit, Dave. So um, that'll work. So this thing, I think I mentioned this to you, uh, this thing is expensive. It, it's uh, probably the reason why I've waited so long to, to finish it, release it. To fabricate something this big, um, custom, low run, uh, $1,500. And people are like, no, not $1,500. I'm not going to buy it. So instead what we're doing, I brought some of this in. Uh, I've got some one inch extrusion from Faztech. Now there's other stuff, Mitsumi and whatnot, but I'm gonna, at Maker Faire, instead of bring this guy, I'm gonna bring a aluminum frame model. Now Black Belt, I think has even shown a picture of one that he's done like this. The Black Belt was uh, extruded aluminum. But with just very little metal, uh, I have a design that there's a couple surprises in it I don't want to talk about, but uh, with extruded aluminum, we have all the parts here uh, to just bolt on to this extruded aluminum frame, keep the cost very low, uh, make it a kit, and just put our dip our toes in the water to see if uh, an inexpensive kit might get a little bit of momentum. I've talked about momentum again. But the idea is uh, low barrier to entry, low cost to entry, um, it's an open source uh, uh, slicer, at least a post processor, uh, that can help you get going with the Poly 3D Cloud. And then if, you, if people like it, I could bring out something like this or even the 12 by 12 version. But extruded aluminum can be sized up uh, at any size. So maybe we'll end up with a printer that's not really a serious, uh, you know, I don't expect people to buy these things and everybody converts to belt printers because there's still some learning and challenges uh, you know, with kind of maintaining this belt, getting things to stick, keeping it flat, all of that. But uh, with extruded aluminum, it's gonna keep the cost low. So that's what you should expect at Maker Faire. 
I mean, I may bring this one just to show people, but I don't know what the point would be if you can't buy it. So probably just the extruded aluminum. But there may be parts off of this machine. I have four of these, uh, so I'll be doing that. All right, last thing. I've been fooling around with paste extruder. So I just wanted to give you a little teaser. This is uh, the first build of a experimental, lots of printed parts here, one big piece of metal, two piece of metal. And uh, the idea is this would fit any size, okay. I think I can get it out. So there's uh, the Acme nut isn't hooked up. So the Acme nut, it's kind of noisy because I don't have it hooked up. But uh, this is a, a three, three to one or seven to one drive ratio using a regular NEMA 17 that's hidden behind this panel. And it pushes this up so that you can extrude. It's very, very strong. And I'm thinking about putting a geared uh, stepper in there as well. So you could just, you could put clay in there and it would extrude, but that's a lot of force. But this thing is built like a tank. I mean, this thing weighs a lot. So I'm just, and if these uh, are printed right now, but I would do, you know, machine parts. Really looking at what a super, super strong, high-end paste extruder uh, could do. Now, one cool thing about it is, I'll pull it out if I can. You know, the parts aren't great right now, so you'll have to forgive me for just being hard. But if everything was machined in Delrin, it would be easier. All right. All right, anyway. The idea is, can you still see it? Uh, there's a block down here and there's a block up here that accept these two blocks. So um, you could replace this. Come here. Uh, you could replace this to accept a smaller syringe all the way down to teeny tiny itty bitty small why would we want something so small well because I've been contacted by some people that are interested in bio uh, printing and they use uh, just a little bit of material this bio material whatever it is they make it from blood cells now or it's from blood this would be thousands of dollars so they buy it in these little itty bitty things and they they print a 3d matrix and they grow it in a petri dish but uh, with this, how does that come out? I don't even know how that comes out. How do you get that out? That's hilarious. Oh, you rotate it. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, so that comes out. You could have different size, uh, printed sizes of these, um, or at least a plug that would allow you to size it down. Because the thing about my old paste extruders, it only accepted one, one type of uh, syringe. And I want something that works with any type of of syringe and has plenty of power even for very very thick material so for like food and stuff so anyway uh, that's the first design um, I just need an Acme nut and I can test this but I'll bring this to Maker Faire just for fun but that's mostly mostly done I just have to refine these uh, designs for machining all right so I think that was everything I wanted to cover um, I ran late uh, 542 because we started late, but I hope you have a good week and and We'll see you next week. Hopefully we'll have some of this stuff printing running a little more to show you next week. So thanks for joining us So the new crawl bot will actually include uh, rails uh, to make it not, uh, it won't be able to cut four foot by eight foot sheets unless you order your own custom extrusion. The problem with that extrusion is that it, you have to freight ship the extrusion to get, you know, it's almost nine foot uh, sections. But I will sell a kit, an all in one kit minus extrusion. <laughs> it's not really all in one. But the only other kit besides the all-in-one with extrusion small version, which is, uh, what did we decide? I think it's 18 inches by 24 inches. Um, did we go out there and show that yesterday? We didn't, did we? No. Ooh. I can do that right now. Ha-ha. That's right. Cause, um, right? Because it doesn't matter on the, the yeah, microphone? Yeah. That's right. I was going to test the audio a little bit since we got this. Okay.
So I'm, I'll take you out and show you the 18 by 24 inch uh, size with the vacuum table that we're testing. But also, what? Uh, the other size that we're going to offer is just sized for as long, uh, for extrusion on the length, the long part of the Crawlbot V2. Uh, the, it's the longest ex extrusion we can get shipped via UPS, I think. Um, so it does shorten from the old Crawlbot where you could cut an 8 foot length. It shortens uh, that length substantially, but it makes it a little more um, usable in a garage, which is really my, you know, I'm not, I don't really want to sell these to professionals. You should go out and invest the money on a machine that has the maximum output. And, uh, oh, we're going to try plugging this sucker in. Charge it. Charge it a little bit. Here we go. I won't be out there long. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, so the Crawlbot V2, the good news is it's going to be quite a bit less money than the Crawlbot V1. So while it, it showed that, yeah, you can, uh, you can use that thing to cut large sheets, flat pack, furniture style stuff uh, in your garage, it's quite expensive. So the, the price is going to come down quite a bit. So that's pretty cool. Uh, one other thing. Well, I mean, this is just an impromptu show. Um, check this out. I got Eora 3D. It was a Kickstarter... for a scanner, and I actually have a couple of scanners in here, three scanners in here. Um, 3D scanning, it all kind of sucks, honestly. The best one I'll save for last, it's the one I've been happiest with, but this Eora 3D, I've backed several Kickstarters uh, for 3D scanning. This one is the most recent and it's Eora 3D. It comes with this and I have no idea how much it is but I'll show you how it works. Uh, this is just a mock-up. Oddly they didn't send me the turntable for this so I gotta write them and say why didn't you send me the turntable? But the idea is that you go like this with your cell phone and it'll fit you know any size cell phone there. And what I thought it did was uh, move your cell phone, but it doesn't. Um, it actually just is stationary. There is a little thing on bottom that you could put it on a uh, typical tripod. But anyway, imagine this sitting here and our subject sitting here. Um, this moves. So you got a little stepper motor in here. It's like a probably a geared stepper or it might be very small but it's kind of hard to turn so it can uh, turn itself like this so maybe I don't need a turntable but it's not going to do a complete you know surround without this little turntable that's supposed to sit here so if you can imagine you know this on a turntable and it rotating I don't know what it does but this one is cool because it does a it uses a laser so it brushes a laser across and it captures that with the cell phone. So it'll scan this laser across and do a very accurate, actually the specs on it are more accurate than uh, the other specs on other scanners I've seen. But in the end, the models that I've uh, downloaded, well I looked at online, they have a site online, um, you know they're just about as bad as everything else I've seen. The first scanner that I and I don't mean to be, give a bad review because I haven't even used this yet, so keep that in mind. Um, it's novel. What's nice is I think the mechanic, well, first the design is beautiful. Um, you know, it, it fits with any cell phone. And the uh, laser, you're not going to get any better than a laser. And if I can get that turntable, maybe it is the best of uh, desktop 3D scanning. I don't know. But... Uh, that's e Eora, E-O-R-A 3D, High Precision 3D Scanner, kind of cool. So that was one, I look forward to using that. I gave my first one away, uh, which is quite old now, and I gave it away because I tried to use it, and it just pretty much sucked. I mean, it wasn't, 
Can you believe this guy is out here just making the most noise possible? Every time I try to do a video, it's like the train at the old location. Ah! Dude! Ah! Can you believe this? Hilarious! Yeah, I'll try the lapel. So the next scanner... There we go. All right, it's on. He's uh, Dave's going to try another uh, thing. The other, the other one I got that I thought was just so cool is called Bevel, and this is a different approach. But the hilarious thing is, um, this was in development before. It also uses a laser, uh, and it was in development before. Apple announced that it's dumping the headphone jack. <laughs> so, Dave, you're going to have to try this one uh, because it only works on iPhones. With, well, I mean, it might work on Android. But I don't even know. Did I just break it? It's funny. I was excited about this because it's so cheap. I mean, look how small this thing is. Um, anyway, this is bevel. I bought a couple of them. I might even have three of these. Uh, but I tried it one time on my wife's cell phone. I always hand down my cell phones when I get new ones. And you know, mine's the iPhone 10 3D printed case. Uh, yeah, and that's a problem because that doesn't work. So I haven't tried it with this one with that adapter thing that you get. I don't have it in here, but uh, Apple does send you an adapter that goes to the the small jack. I can try it. But anyway, I was frustrated with that uh, because it was really, it comes with this and it was not, not great. Um, these scanners are really only useful for um, people, that, right now, that people that are willing to do some, well, a lot of post-processing, like with mesh, or what's that called? Uh, Mesh Maker, do you remember the name of that software? It's the Auto Mesh Mixer, uh, because you got to go in and clean up these models to like. There's always these weird bumps, since it all has to do with light. Very very uh, hard to level the playing field across all sorts of people, with all sorts of lighting and all sorts of environments. The background texture that you use is, d you know, it's almost counterintuitive because some people want to put stuff that they take photos of in a white background, that's actually not the best um, for some of these that use photogametry, you know, pictures. They want a really, really rough, stat uh, rough texture in the background uh, so that the photo processing software can distinguish the background from the foreground. So you want a lot of noisy uh, color, textury background. So anyway, it's kind of counterintuitive. There's just a big learning curve. The stuff that they show in the videos for 3D scanners, look how easy it is to use. Click, rotate, you know, and bing, you're printing. It's not like that at all. So anyway, that's a bevel. Uh, you know, fun toy to play with, but it's really just for art stuff. The, I was trying to scan this little elephant that I have at home. It's just a little marble statue. And I'm telling you what, after like an hour or so and where like one leg was missing the trunk disappeared and then reappeared it was just like ah I cannot get this to work at all so disenchanted with that as well but the one that I love 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 is this one and this is more expensive uh, it has I forget how this works because this has been out for a while but this is this uh, by occipital um, it is a laser as well. It's a class one laser. That's by occipital, and it's called the structure sensor. This one is model ST01. Um, they've updated this, and they released it. They kind of transitioned from well, 3D scanning. You know, 3D printing was at a like a really, really, really high back a few years ago. 
And so a lot of 3D scanners came out, and I think some of these companies kind of realized, well, we're not all going to own 3D um, scanners, and it's not like the new Xerox uh, because of all the involved difficulty. The software had a long way to go. But what you do, and I need to print one for this new iPhone, um, but what happens is you get a case, and there are people that have designed uh, cases for this. There's four little itty bitty screws, uh, screw holes on this, and a, a little bezel that you can print a case for your phone. Because the when you calibrate this thing with your phone, it's neat because it uses both a camera or a sensor for the laser. I think it's a camera actually. Uh, the laser's over here, offset from where you have your camera. I think that that's what this thing is doing too. It's offset. Uh, from the sensor for the laser. So you want to get a parallax, you know, you want to, that may not be the right word, you want to get an offset so that you can triangulate the laser from the camera. So this offset is it's long and looks different than these other ones um, because the, the further away for, I don't know that this is true in all situations, but in this case, you want to get it uh, away from the angle uh, you know you don't want to get it concentric with the laser you want to get it uh, away from it so that that triangulation uh, can be predictable and when you it actually also uses the camera in the iPhone or the phone and leverages that camera with the laser and the laser sensor so anyway it's pretty cool this is this laser is not visible so um, you don't really see it when you scan. It just looks like it's a camera going around a person. What I like about this one is it's handheld. It tracks very well using the accelerometer and the camera um, so that you can, you can just plug it in. I don't think I can do a demo because I've got to calibrate. Those cases hold it in a known position. You actually have to take some calipers and measure the offset from the camera lens uh, to the sensor on this thing so that the math and the software can like get it all to jive. Anyway, but this produces fantastic results. It emails you the model like right there. I mean, you're done scanning and there's no like wait for it. It's like boom, and then you get this. So I printed it. This is a 3D scan of my son. You can see that it's not very detailed uh, because why did I do that? I think there was different options in resolution. I may have uh, tessellated or like reduced the, the triangles in Mesh Mixer. What I did in Mesh Mixer is I just cut off the bottom flat. It tries uh, to give you something that you can use, um, but I always angle the print uh, to where I want it to be. So you can see that, well maybe you can't, but the, the chin on this one uh, when you scan people, that's a problem with my face scan. I have scans of myself and it almost works better to cut my cut my neck up like that and have it stand on the goatee. <laughs> so because you you're always dealing with the angle on the nose, you can do support. But anyway, so of the unused, untested Eor 3D, which you know I have some hope about for desktop objects, larger objects, people, the structure scanner is the best, and the bevel is great if you want to play around with it. There's also some photogametry stuff that's uh, pretty good just for the phone. I hate that um, the uh, Autodesk, what, what was that called? One two three D or one two three D catch or something like that. I don't know why Autodesk it just dumped it. Um, it was pretty good actually uh, for for free. I don't know what happened there. All right. I wonder if anybody else has questions. Uh, how's the how's the sound working out? How's the sound, guys? And be gentle. Dave's working hard here. He got all this security issues fixed. I'm reading some. I'm reading some of the comments. Hey, Chris, um, which of the, 
low-end scanners um, were you talking about? Oh, you were talking about the Eora, huh? So, man, I don't know why I didn't get the turntable. I don't know if I have to, maybe it was how I backed it on Kickstarter. Maybe I have to buy it separately. I'm going to inquire. So, what, there's 11 people here. Hey, I'll take you out and show you the vacuum table. Sarah? Sarah Hale joined? What's she doing? Hey, Ben. Uh, let's see. How do you like the resin printing? I heard it's pretty messy. We'll check this out. Who was that? Bradley White. See that? Uh, I've got my Kickstarter. It's like a Kickstarter party. Uh, I got my Kickstarter um, Form Labs. I did the $700 upgrade for uh, the Form Labs. I don't know what they upgraded. They upgraded something. And I sent it off to them and sent it back. It was really expensive. Um, I think I paid, it seems like it was thousands, 3000 2000 for that printer. I swear, if I've done a half a dozen prints on that thing, I'd be shocked. Um, I bought tons of resin, it's in here somewhere, uh, trying to, with the intention to, to try to figure out, uh, is there cheaper resin for these resin printers? Hey, what's that green light that just flashes on this thing? Am I okay? I don't know, it just like went green and then back to the red. Okay. Anyway, uh, this resin printer, um, you know, I wish I could justify buying the new Form Labs um, because here's the biggest thing. The resin is extremely messy. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. And it's not good for the skin. It's not for kids. Um, the, the few prints that I got out of it that did work were really cool. Here's one. Uh, this was me testing this filament, or filament, it's uh, plastic. The cool thing about the resin is it can do extremely detailed stuff. There's really no visible layer lines. Um, but getting it off, I mean, this was all it was to get it off the bed. You know, it, it, it kind of pulls up out like that. So when you're done, you, you have to get this stuff off. And to get it off, uh, you take this removable I'll show you. You take this removable thing. Oh, glad I noticed that. It actually has resin on it. I'm exposing it. <laughs> so this is stuck to the bottom. And you have to basically use a chisel uh, to get this stupid stuff off the bottom. So when I use the chisel, yeah, it... Uh, totally cracked that model. So, you know, a 12-hour freaking print, beautiful otherwise, got chipped to, to get it off the build platform. Ugh. Anyway, um, the bed, the print bed, or like the, the vat uh, that holds the resin, I gave it to one of my employees to, I've told this story, but I gave it to one of my employees, Sam. Uh, he no longer works here. Um, to uh, to play with because he was just into it. Uh, he was one of my customer support guys, a great guy. Uh, but he overfilled. He didn't follow the instructions. He overfilled the vat, and when that build platform came down, it like overflowed and dumped. If you can imagine how bad this is, it dumped that resin all over the electronics in the mirror. So I had to tear this stupid thing apart and uh, try to clean it out. It, it took like most of a day to do that. And then in the process, the power supply plug got damaged. Carl came over and helped me troubleshoot that, and we fixed that. It was just uh, one of the pads had pulled up when I you know, took the case apart. Um, so that was my fault. What else? But now you turn the dumb thing on, and it just goes So I think uh, one of the motors might have got damaged. I'm going to have to call Carl back and see if he can help me 
get this thing fixed. I mean, I don't know. It's it's a uh, it's a good process if you need super high resolution and y it is not for end use. Prototyping. I don't know, man. I I just can't. I, I I'm not in love with it because. For for Dennis, I could see it. For jewelry, I could see it. Other than that, I'm trying to think: what is this good for? Um, you just don't need that resolution if you're doing mechanical things like I do. So the sweet spot for me, and I think other hobbyists, is FDM. Um, you know, it's one of those things. You spend a lot of money, hoping. It's not that I was I succumbed to the hype. It's that. What's up, Mark? Uh, it's that I wanted to stay on the bleeding edge, and so I put down the money, and ultimately I was kind of disappointed. But I, let me tell you, they're selling like hotcakes. A form lab. I know Max, the CEO. He's a great guy. His, uh, you know who's better than Max is his wife. She's awesome. Uh, way better sense of humor than Max. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's all I got to say about resin printing. It's just like mm, if you got. If you've got an inexpensive one to play around with, just don't spend a lot of money until you know, yeah, it's for you, because it's not for everybody. Jonathan's asking, he has a simple pro and was printing a circular column, and the surface finish is very rough. Beautiful spelling of rough, R-U-F-F. -F. And horrible. <laughs> hey, don't pull any punches, Jonathan. Give it to me straight, man. How was it? Was it bad? I, I don't mean to mock you. Uh, so the surface finish. Um, one thing a lot of people don't really, they uh, may underestimate is the value of going slow. Maybe it was on stock speed, so maybe I don't want to talk about that. But uh, you got to go slow, and you want to um, use extra fans. If, if the surface finish really, really, really matters to you, uh, going slow and using extra fans literally placed around the model that's printing, like desk fans or something, like an uh, unbelievably ridiculous amount of fans. Uh, that's how you get the best uh, resolution. The, I usually, well, I mean, I have some prints here that uh, have, th these were some of the earliest prints of the Simple Pro, and we were using USB printing on this, so if you want the best uh, printing, I would actually use USB printing. The reason I say that is circular models are actually the most problematic in Cura, and we're using Cura Engine to slice. In Cura, um, Cura kind of does the worst for Sorry, what? Oh, my British Siri, for some reason. Oh, I bet it thought I was talking to it. Anyway. Uh, Cura, whoop. Cura, oh man, see, this is the problem with resin printing. I dripped a little bit on my computer. Oh, that's just beautiful. Hold on. It's hilarious. I am always, like, whatever can go wrong with me, <laughs> absolutely will. Okay. That's okay. Brushed, unless I got it on myself. Aluminum wipes off pretty good. Um, surface finish. So Cura does a uh, weird thing when it does circles. If you have a high resolution model and you have perfect circles that in the model it just looks gorgeous, um, that means it's going to divide that circle up into the maximum amount of segments, which means straight lines. So on the uh, Simple Pro, for ultra high resolution, resolution, resolution models, um, there is like the maximum amount of straight lines with little itty bitty angles. So you cross this line at which the processing power needed to really do a good job streaming uh, that, uh, so there's a couple of speed bumps that you hit with the Simple Pro. One is the processing power of the Teensy that we use on the, the printer hub, the touchscreen. Um, that has a limit. It's not infinite. And then also, even the G2, even though we're talking about ARM processors, uh, the G2, it's doing math 
essentially live for the acceleration curves in the model. So imagine if you had an infinite amount of small, an infinite amount of infinitely small straight line segments for a circle with an infinitely small angle. And G2 is trying to process each angle so that it can speed up and slow down. It's not as sophisticated for really, 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 really detailed things. It was built on uh, CNC. Uh, basically, it was built for CNC. And CNC uh, doesn't have near the amount of angles that uh, you know, circle on a high, or um, yeah, I guess angles is the right word uh, for three D printing. It just brings all of the complicated stuff into a really tight area, so you you end up running into that. So here's how you can improve it: go into your model. Like if you're doing your model in Fusion three hundred and sixty, you have an advantage because you can actually dictate how um, the resolution of export when you export the STL, you can dictate the resolution. And what you, what you want to avoid is instead of a million lines for a circle, you might want to do like whatever, hundreds. So I've seen a huge improvement on syndrilical uh, drawings that I've done, um, you know, like spiral vase stuff. I say spiral vase. I mean, like sometimes I print hollow cylinders. Um, it, or essentially, they're shapes that are cylinders. And if you go in and lower the resolution when you export the STL in Fusion 360, well, it, l it lowers the requirements of all of these speed bumps that you hit. Uh, it kind of avoids those speed bumps. So you can get a much faster print. <laughs>